Okay, here we go. Uh, all right, remembering the Stony Creek and Western. This is a photograph of the, out of focus, photograph of the Stony Creek and Western Bridge in British Columbia, Canada. Gil was looking for a project and Virginia found a photograph of this bridge and Gil decided that he would make a model of the Stony Creek Bridge. And this is what he made. Now, what's besides being a beautiful model, what's remarkable is this is not made out of styrene. This was made 50 years ago. These are wooden pieces. And if you look really close, the little cross members here, that's pieces of cardstock that he cut and glued there to make those cross members there. So that is wood and paper. Okay, now the question was, why is it called the Stony Creek and Western? Well, Gil did this first locomotive here that you see. It's a um, little diesel locomotive and he started to decal it and he realized that he was going to be an E short. So instead of spending 40 cents more for another decal set, he just took the E out and it became the Stony Creek and Western as you see it now. That's a Bowser K4, by the way, that he ground the Bell of Fire Firebox off for the old Pitline Bowser K4. Okay, here is an original uh, drawing of the layout. And for those of us that saw it in recent years, you see this really large layout. The large layout didn't come until much later. Originally, the layout was going to be 20 by 22. And then he got this little section that's up here added even before he started. I mean, he negotiated with Virginia before he even started and it grew before, you know, planning ahead. Now, notice the track work in here and how it circles around and has a lot of hidden trackage and everything. We're gonna see a lot of that later. Notice this open spot. This is the pit that we'll see later for operating Dixie Yard, which is called South Yard at this time. And it was accessed by a duck under. So here we get started. This is uh, at Stony Creek. You can see that Gil hand laid his track, almost all of it. You'll see there's a little piece right here that is flex track, but all the rest of it is hand laid track. And what's interesting is Gil cut his own ties. All those ties he cut, but what's even more interesting, his partner, Virginia, she would glue those down in the daytime while she was taking care of the kids in the house so that when Gil came home at night, he could add track to the ties that she had put down. Okay, here he is at work. You see the roundhouse there at Stony Creek. You see the turntable. You see the line that comes across. And you can see that right here that Gil is uh, doing Colorado modeling because right here he has a can of Colorado Kool-Aid. All right, there he is working on what's here is Toluca. Shingle Springs here, and in the back is Apex. That's the Apex right there. And you see this is accessed by a duck under also. Uh, let's see. See, modifying some of the scenery here. And Bob was the one that first noticed this. Look at these. Here's that 
he cast and he carved himself, but this pier goes all the way through the scenery, all the way down here. All of those extend all that distance down. All right, and notice this bridge here. We're gonna see this bridge all through the photographs. That bridge was there installed and stayed for 50 years. All right, here's the town of Arapaho and Gil's uh, building it. And if you look real quick, we're gonna see this area, this Texaco place in later photographs, but notice how small the layout is. Here's the curve that goes around to Quinn's Bend. You can see the wall coming down here at an angle. Back here is what's now Dixie Yard, but just a few tracks. And here's the uh, bridge and the bunker that we'll see. Now, most of Arapaho will stay the same, except these buildings right here will move when the layout grows. Here is Ben Perlman. Uh, those of you that are recent to the Houston area may not know that Papa's Bend was named after Ben Perlman. Ben was the original owner of uh, Papa Ben's. He was a close friend of uh, Gill's and all of us. Uh, he was an in-scale modeler. For many, many years, Sanjak met in Ben Perlman's uh, production studios over um, off of uh, Kirby and also later over by the Astrodome. Okay, here's the town of uh, Apex. Once again, it is accessed by Duck Under. And notice the train. The train is a Union Pacific train. At this time, Gill was not focusing on the Rio Grande and the Santa Fe. He was, whatever train he liked, that's what he ran, partially because that's what was available. All right, here's Bob Stanley working. And once again, you see uh, a mess. You see the uh, Union Pacific train. Here's the, the bridges that we're gonna see later. And here's the duck under to get to Apex. Okay. Here we are at Dixie Yard. Notice how small it is at this time. This is great. There's only six tracks in, in Dixie Yard. If you look behind him, I'm not gonna use my hand. If you look behind him, you'll see that the doorway there is blocked by the narrow gauge town coming across there. So to get into Dixie and to work at Arapaho, which you can see part of the bridge there, you, you had to go through a duck under. All right, there's the, you can see the door that I was talking about and we don't have internet, so great. Okay, thanks. Um, notice the bridges here at the bottom. You're gonna see those bridges. They will move around the layout as the layout grows. You'll see back here, You'll see that uh, Dixie Yard just makes a quick turn and you can see the wall coming down right there. You see that angle. So it was a small area at this time. Okay, now we're starting to get some scenery. So this is a narrow gauge town of uh, Black Gap down by the canyon. You see the gauntlet bridge above it. And notice it's got a Southern Pacific locomotive pulling the train. It's not uh, Santa Fe or Rio Grande. And in the background, you have the famous Stony Creek Bridge. Okay, Bob Dandenbrink operates in uh, Arapaho. And once again, you see the two buildings closest to the left-hand side. Those buildings will be moved later as the layout grows. Here is Arapaho, and once again, notice how small it is. The other operators there doing Dixie Yard, the two operators in the 
the duck under to do Dixie and Arapaho. It turns at the very back there and goes into Quinn's Bend. That's how big the layout was. All right, Ed Quinn switches at Quinn's Bend. Once again, you can see the wall coming down. Ed is almost bumping his head on the ceiling as it comes down there. Ed is the only person that had a town named after him on the railroad. Greg Johnson and Bob Stanley switched to Luca. And you see now we got a Southern Pacific passenger train with a Union Pacific passenger train. The, uh, the arch uh, causeway has been uh, stained and everything. And we've got all kinds of new bridges and the backdrop. And here we are at the canyon again. You see the uh, gauntlet bridge. And then behind it is the Stony Creek Bridge. And down at the bottom, you see the narrow gauge town of Black Gap. I'm sorry? Yes. And this is a scene for those of us that got to operate early on the layout. This was confusing because you see all of these bridges and all these tunnels and up at the top, you see another track. You would go in one tunnel and you would think it was coming out the next tunnel. And then you'd hear some guy, who's running this train? And it would be on the other side of the room coming out. So this, this was confusing, but as the layout grew, Gill would take away this and make it much more linear so that you did follow with your trains. And this is uh, David Milton, good friend of uh, all of us. And uh, David was a self-taught uh, artist and he painted all the backdrops on the Stony Creek. All right, now we start into operations and look at this high tech piece of equipment we have here for operations. Uh, that is on the aisle. You can see the, the bridge here on the bottom left corner. That is the Gauley Bridge and uh, their backside is up against Quinn's Bend and the other side is there at Arapaho. And you can see how small the area is. And here's a better view of that control panel. If you look real close, you can see that the rotating um, switches there gave you four cabs. So there were four different trains that could be operated with cab control at the same time on the Stony Creek in this time period. All right, here is one of the early switch lists. And Virginia would type these up and there was a packet of them. You would have, um, one session, all the trains that were gonna run in that time, and Virginia would type them up. Gil would give her the information, she'd type it up. There would be session two, session three, session four. So as they operated each time, they would get another session. Well, Gil operated so often, it was long until the operators had the sessions memorized. So Virginia had to continually update and come up with uh, new operating scenarios. There you go. Okay, now we're really going to start seeing. Now we're really going to see some growth on, on the layout. You see up here added a four by nine foot dispatcher's ring. Okay. And that meant that later the ceiling that I showed Ed Quinn bumping his head on is raised in this area and it's a straight down wall. So now you get all of this additional space in this area. And as a result, those industries that I told you that would move in Arapaho, they moved from here, they moved to a new, new area called East Arapaho. Quinn's Bend becomes much larger. You get the dispatcher's panel and um, 
you start seeing some changes down here at Black Gap. And in that new dispatcher's office, you get this new control panel. And if you look at this control panel, you will see that now you can run six trains. You have six cabs instead of the previous four. And here's Gil dispatching from the new panel. And I want you to look right about uh, past Gil's head at that wiring. My dad worked for AT&T in the telephone office and he saw that photograph and he didn't think he saw that much wiring in the telephone office. And I will also tell you a little bit about Gil's wiring. Gil would start here and maybe it needed a six foot wire. Oh, that's great. Uh, so, um, but he had a four foot wire of one color a six inch of another color, a foot of another. So he would just tie them together. So it worked, but don't ever try to trace the wiring because it's not gonna be the same color from one end to the other. And here's Ben Perlman with a string chart dispatching. And you can see he's got a radio, I mean, a telephone headset on. They start communicating to the different towns via the telephone. And the computer has gone down. Okay. Now we see even more scenery going in. You see the curved viaduct coming over Stony Creek Yard. You see the uh, roundhouse. And Gilbert, I'll ask you, um, did your dad win a contest with the roundhouse? I know it was all carved and he did all that, but okay. But also look at this bridge. I mean, most of us as model railroaders, we would end the bridge here and this would be all rock work here. But Gil put in this supports for this bridge and each support is different. And it really makes it a unique scene. It makes it much more like the prototype. It's not just, you know, not just dirt piled up there. Okay, now we see uh, the viaduct again that he carved and, and poured himself. Now we see a new one coming in here. We see the town of Apex. There's some stations you can barely see. We're gonna see those move around in Apex. This uh, covered bridge has moved from where it was over here. And earlier photographs, um, this area right here was where the stamp mill was. And this beautiful model was back there hidden away. And Gil came back and changed that to the rock quarry. And I'll also point this out that this little water tower here. Gilbert pointed this out to me. If you look at that water tower, it doesn't look like it belongs. Because if you look at the base, the base is white stone. The rest of the area is not white stone. This was a gift from John Lawrence to Gil for the layout. And Gil uh, was so appreciative of it, the fact that it might not exactly match didn't matter. Gil was more concerned about the fellowship and everything that stayed on the layout for 50 years. Okay, now we're going into the narrow gauge. Uh, back here, you can see the station that's in Arapaho. This is uh, coming up along Arapaho. Remember these bridges right here because you're gonna see them later. They're gonna move as the layout grows. But uh, Gil had a limited amount of uh, narrow gauge. He said had Blackstone models been out when he started, he would have had a lot more narrow gauge. But at the time, they just didn't run that well. Okay, in 1977, Gil entered uh, Gus's bulk shipper 
in the NMRA contest and he won third place. And there's another photograph of it. And there was a owner of a company called Fine Scale Miniatures. George Selyos saw this and he asked Gil if he would mind if he produced a kit based on his scratch built model. And Gil gave him an okay. And this is what George Selyos made with Fine Scale Miniatures. And it's hard to read. I will read it to you there. Well, I can't read it, but in the ad, it says um, something along the line, it's impossible to make a model as good as a craftsman as Gil Freitag, but they would try. And he specifies Gil Freitag in the ad. And of course, uh, they made, I think there were 2,500 kits at the ridiculous price of $38. So, you know. uh, so if you can find kit number 165 from Fine Scale Miniatures, now you know that it was based on a model that Gil made for the Stony Creek. Here's our computer expert, Gilbert Freitag, on a high-tech Radio Shack computer as he uh, starts writing the first comp computer program for computer print out a switch list, and here's the results. And you can see that, uh, you know, you would go in, you'd go to Provo, and it tells you here that uh, this is your train number, this is uh, where you're departing from, where you're going to. The first thing you're going to do is set out these three cars at Provo, but you have to be careful. You have to look down here, because this is where your pickups are. You pick up three cars in Provo. And uh, it was interesting for new operators. They would often end up at uh, the opposite um, yard and the yard master would say, well, where are your cars? And they said, what do you mean? They said, I, I did what it said up there. And they said, well, no, you're supposed to do up at the top and down at the bottom, so. Then things really took off in 1983 when there was no longer cab control, go to Dynatrol. So uh, those of you that aren't familiar with it, you plug in these little pins here that gives you your address for your locomotive and allows you to operate how many? 16? 18. Yeah, 18. One didn't work. Sixteen. There you go. Well, it's still an incredibly reliable operating system. <laughs> it, you don't lose trains during the session like you can with DCC. And Gil, once he went to this and we started transferring to DCC, Gil decided there was no way. He had cut so many locomotives, um, weights out, and everything to put in the Dynatro receivers that he was not going to go to DCC. So every time someone sold a system because they were going to DCC, Gil bought it. And there's a warehouse full of uh, DCC, I mean, uh, Dynatro stuff for the Stony Creek. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been longer than that. Okay, I'm going to try to point out things on this because major changes started happening in the 1990s. Um, at this time, um, Gil said, if you're going to expand your layout and you have children, make sure you know which one's going to leave the house first so that you can take their bedroom to make the train layout. <laughs> 
I know. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so initially, this is the dividing point right here, okay, for one part. But if you look at this right here, the wall came down right here. And remember those early photographs where the duck under was for Stony Creek? That wall came right here, and that's where the door was. And this wall came on down here. So this expanded Dixie Yard. We get the new, all of this uh, hidden staging in Dixie Yard. Um, this was the first real expansion into Craig, and now we get this branch line. The branch line comes out of Apex, it comes around here, it climbs up, goes around, and comes into the town of Craig. When uh, Alan Keller did his video on the Stoning Creek, the end of the video has Gil standing right here with a hammer and a chisel indicating this isn't the last, it's gonna grow bigger. And sure enough, it did. But then you see, this was the um, area of the game room. So now it starts oozing out into the game room. We get a new town called Eagle Mountain. We get a new area called Pagosa Junction, and da 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 da. Over here, he rerouted the main line. So the main line comes down here, but there wasn't enough room. He didn't want another bridge across here. So the option is to run it through the wall right here and go outside wall into a window. And that's what he did. So, oh, as you can see, he did not want another bridge across this canyon. So he built this entrance here, and there is a window, a regular window in this wall on the outside. The only way you can get to this track is via the outside on a two-story ladder. Now, those of you that read my little article about the first night we operated, well, this is the area, my train was going in here, it goes in there, boom, it stops. So back it up, try it again. Gil came over, told me to go full blast, you know, through the canyon or through the tunnel to try to knock out whatever was in there. And, you know, I, I stopped, it's like, really? You want me to go full blast? He said, yeah, we got to find out what's in the tunnel, knock it out. Well, <laughs> It, nothing came out. So Gil had to go outside on the ladder at night in a drizzling rain and open up the outside window. And hopefully the computer. So he goes out, he opens it up, he looks and train comes through and it stops but the lights on and everything and there's nothing in the tunnel it's like what's going on well uh i'll show you more later but basically i ran it through again and my train derailed and we found out that there was an articulated hopper car and it was catching outside of the tunnel i'll go back to it So as my train is going right here, this wall right here had a little piece of uh, plaster on it. And my train was actually catching something right there, not in the tunnel at all. So once we figured it out, Gil came with a hammer and <laughs> he took care of it. <laughs> okay, here's a nice big scene. Now the layout is expanded. You see how large it is, but that's a long distance to uh, have to reach in case you have some kind of problem with the layout. So there's Bob with one of the duck unders, I mean, one of the lift outs so that you can access the track. 
Okay, now here's a track plan from 2003. Now you see that Eagle Mountain is now this direction instead of this way. It's extended a great deal. Now Pagosa and Pagosa Junction are right here and they're much longer. Now over here, we've got Tlacopaki that previously it ended right there. Now it goes here. And when Gil was building Tlacopaki, he wanted to do that and Virginia said, no, said, I've got, that's closet space. I can't give up all that space. And he said, well, what if I build shelves underneath? And she thought about it and said, okay. And when we see Tlacopaki, it's built on cabinets so that she didn't lose her storage. Now, this is when Gil made the cover and we surprised him with a cover party. Um, and I have to tell a little story about what you're seeing right now. That photograph we called Model Railroader. Well, first, where's Bob Wary? Bob, that's Bob's photograph. So when that magazine came out, we didn't want a standard cover because it has all the bullets on it, you know, where they, they tell you how much it costs and all the interior. So Cody Grivno with Model Railroader wrote that story that year. We contacted Cody and said, can we get a photograph of the cover, just the artwork with Model Railroader on? And he said, sure. And he sent us a file. Well, we didn't want an eight and a half by 11. We want a huge. So race at Spring Crossing had a huge color printer. He printed that out. We had it uh, framed and surprised Gil with it when we had his surprise cover party. All right, now, besides uh, those others, additions, we now have a dispatcher room with a CTC board. And it, this thing was amazing. And the other thing that was amazing was we had uh, Gil always was open for our home layout tours at Thanksgiving. And we all went and we saw the layout. This did not exist this okay it was not in the room we came back for our annual christmas party that was installed it wasn't working but he had built out the room extended it out and moved that in and you want to tell them how you got it in there no Okay, uh, wow, that's somebody that had hair at one time. Um, the uh, dispatcher was also responsible for, for the trains in Middletown, the staging, and you can see right here for open house, um, this was the through tracks that made continuous running possible. 
Uh, in an operating session, the railroad basically operated point to point. So you had a lot of trains that originated and terminated here at uh, uh, Middletown. Okay, another change occurred in 2004 when uh, started using RELOP. And I don't know why it's out of focus, but uh, hopefully you can see. Um, and once again, it was Virginia that worked on this. And I had RELOP at the same time. And it was so much fun before an operating session at the Stony Creek. Uh, Virginia would call me up with a problem and she'd say, I can't figure this out, you know, where, where is this? And I'd say, you know, something like, well, just at the top right corner, you just click right there and she's clicking. I can always hear her say, duh. Okay, now we're going to do a quick trip around the Stony Creek. Uh, the roundhouse and the station at Provo. Now this area right here, when we saw the window through the dispatcher's uh, room, that was covered up with these structures here. Uh, Tom Patterson was usually the yard master in Dixie Yard. And look how much it's grown from when we started. It was only five tracks. Look how large it is now. It's got all this. It's got service facilities. Uh, here's a, uh, a little aside. This building right here, this uh, coaling tower is built by Cecil Stewart. And once again, you know, that was one of the nice things that Gil did. If, if you built something that you wanted to have put on his layout, he graciously accepted and, you know, was happy to put it on his layout. I'll also tell you that uh, it was a good thing that um, Tom liked to uh, do the yards because when the Stony Creek was signaled, it was uh, single multicolor LEDs and Tom is colorblind. So he couldn't tell what he was getting on the signals. So he couldn't run the main line. Okay. More view of uh, Dixie Yard. Once again, you can see how big it is. You see this structure right here, our own Bob Barnett. He built that for Gill. You see the passenger station. And now you notice it's Santa Fe. Now we have a definite identity for the railroad, Santa Fe and Rio Grande. Now we go around and uh, the town of uh, Pagosa Junction. And you see that um, the bridge that I told you to remember, the narrow gauge, there they are, they've relocated. Um, but notice how spectacular the scenery is. I mean, it, it just, you know, as the layout progressed, so did the, uh, the scenery and everything else that's on it. Pagosa Junction, little station here. Okay, we have the narrow gauge coming up here. We have the Denver and Rio Grande coming in here. They have a trackage rights on the Stony Creek. And here's a train coming on the main line. Once again, you see, yeah, you can't read, but the Denver and Rio Grande coming on and you've got uh, Santa Fe working all right, now we got Eagle Mountain, the next town around. And the Dittlinger Mill. This was scratch built based on the Dittlinger Mill that is in New Bronzeville, Texas. Now, this was never entered in a contest, but I tell you what, it is one incredible structure. There you go. And this is something else that Gil did, which I thought was very good. You notice that it's one industry, but you've got two tracks. You've got to put boxcars here, you have to put hopper cars here. So when you come into the town, 
there's a lot of extra work that you get to do because you can't just shove the cars down a siding. There's specific areas that they're supposed to go to. Now, this is the, uh, as it says, first place winner, 1972, the stamp mill. And what's really innovative, I think, on this, besides the superior craftsmanship, is that so often you'll see a model and the modeler will say, well, look, it's got a complete interior, but you don't see it until they go over and they take the top off. So what did Gil do? He built a structure where the top is off of it because they're adding on to it. So you get to see all of this wonderful stamp mill. You've got the belt over here. You've got all of the interior detail, all of the, the work. You've got the employees building it and you don't have to take the roof off of it because it's always open. Uh, there's another view of it. And even over here, the same thing. This building is getting a new roof and you can look through and see the interior right there. I think it's a, a great way to show off your modeling. Here it is, uh, another view. Oop. And you see Bozeman casting there. We continue around and this will come later, but look at this, a hand laid double crossover curve, uh, turn out on a curve. This was built after he had put all this other track down. This was not double track mainline here. He added that later and came in and just built a Double crossover on a curve. Another view, you looking at um, Rapaho, our train would be coming out of uh, Eagle Mountain. It would be coming across here and going up to Salina. Now we go across the yard and we go to Quinn's Bend. And you remember how small Quinn's Bend was? This structure has moved from down here, over here. This is the track that came through the window. And I always like this. Instead of just a regular old tunnel portal, he has a, a slide shed right here to protect the entrance into the tunnel. All right. Let's look at this real quick. A lot of neat scenery, but how many times have you seen a turnout on a bridge? If you look real close, it's gonna be hard for most people to see, but right here, you can see where the throw bar is for that turnout. All the way down here, way down there, is the switch motor. And it has to go through all of that to throw this turnout but it's also prototypical. He's got a walkway here and a little platform here for the ground crew to stand and throw the turnout so that they can switch in this location. Neat, neat, neat. It's also a three man job to adjust that turnout. <laughs> <laughs> one below, one to the top, one below. <laughs> All right, here's uh, another view. You see up here later, um, this would uh, be infrared control sensors up there for. Uh, Gil named his industries after his friends. This is Fisk Iron Work in Quinn's Bend. Beautiful structure. Talk mill. And like I say, these were all possible because now Quince Bend is a much longer town. And right here, you see he had working semaphores to protect the gauntlet bridge. 
Here's Cecil Stewart at the dual gauge town of Cliff, which was under Quince Bend. It was dual gauge just to Cliff and a little, little bit behind um, Cecil. So um, this was a town that uh, Jim Long in particular always came down and switched and uh, anything past that was narrow gauge only. Here's a view. Now remember earlier, this was where Black Gap was, the narrow gauge town. Now it's been modified. It comes across here. We've got this bridge going across. There's uh, the opening through the window. We've got the Stony Creek Bridge and we've got the Gauntlet Bridge. And the famous Gauntlet Bridge. Now, those of you that aren't familiar with the Gauntlet Bridge, you look right here, that's one rail. That's the other rail going the opposite direction. Then you've got this one and this one. So they overlap. Now, as the layout is right now, that's not too important because it functions like a really long um, passing siding. But at one time, it was two opposing main lines. And uh, there were a lot of cornfield meets on the Gauntlet Bridge. It was a challenge. Okay, another view. Now you get to see a wider view of all the, uh, the depth and everything that he's added. And folks, I am gonna have to start going faster. Okay, now we're going up, we're gonna go through here, we're gonna take this bridge, we're going to go up to Apex and Apex Junction. A neat scene with uh, all the vertical rise there. Another neat bridge, you know. I'm sorry? Yes, he does. In fact, uh, it was something they were going to go back and see it for next year. Yeah. Did he not see it or just see it? He, I don't think he saw it. Another bridge that you look at the supports, they're all different. They, they meet the profile of the the land, it just makes it a lot more interesting. Here's Gil operating one of the sweeper trains. And you see he's got the phone in his hand. He's called dispatcher probably for clearance to do work here at Apex and Apex Junction. Uh, one of the mines, Apache Pat mine. No, this is a Leanna mine, sorry. Um, here, another bridge. And you look at the supports, each one of them is different. Just makes it a whole lot more interesting bridge. Okay, this photograph I have in here because we talked about the expansion. If you look at this right here, that wall, this direction was the original layout room, okay? And then we saw the ex expansion and I told you that uh, Dixie Yard expanded out. Well, it came out past that wall and we can't see it here. Let's see if I can. Okay, you see back here, there's the dispatcher's room. All right. And there where Dave is standing is where it started. That was the um, Dixie Yard. That's where the door was. There's that wall, the door was right there. So that shows you how much the layout grew and grew into the different rooms. One of the last structures that uh, Gil Scratch built and added on the layout was uh, a building in honor of John Lawrence. Um, I want you to notice that it says it has chemicals and um, for Fertilize, because fertilize is going to be later when we see this building. Okay. All right. Here's a famous lift bridge. 
as you can see, it actually works. Thanks to Spence, Spence got it working again. And I'll show you a little thing. Don't let the EPA know, but see those two little blocks right there? Those have mercury in it. So when, so when the bridge comes down, it has pins and that makes the electrical contact. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, this, this is one of the areas where people say, okay, there is no lift bridge in Colorado. And Gil's response always was, there is in my Colorado. You know, he didn't build this model just to put on a, a showcase. He built it to put on the layout. And I think there's something else that most people don't know. Does anybody know the name of the location where this bridge is besides Galveston Island? Exactly, it's Virginia Point. So I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, Virginia Point is on the Stony Creek and Western. And the computer's gone down. Okay, another view across uh, Arapaho. You can see these structures here were some of the last. He put this in, it gave the passenger train crews additional work right here. You can see diners and express cars. And then there usually was a, a grain hopper that was here that had to be moved so that you could do the switching there. Right, right here, it's not a clear photograph. Uh, sorry about that, but this is an uncoupling ramp that Gil made early on. And uh, Steve Sandifer can tell you about them. He makes uh, uh, an improved version of these, but these were his uh, handmade electromagnets. Um, you had a dial, you would look at your board and it would have a number or letter beside it. You'd dial that in, you'd push a button and a timer would come on. And if you look right there, you could barely see a green LED. And when that would come on, that told you that that electromagnet was activated and you could pick up or drop your car there once that is activated. Very, very effective because you didn't have false uncouplings. Um, here's a later view of uh, Arapaho, Denny's there, and in the back is Bill Wright. Um, now we're coming into the town of Toluca. Another neat thing that I'll show you right here, if we can see it. Here's this dam, and you see that this is a water feature that comes across here, and it gets here and it doesn't cross the track it goes under the track. And you go, well, how does the water work? Well, most of us know water finds its own level. So it goes under and then it reappears over here, comes down here, turns the wheel and goes out. Just one of those really neat things that uh, sometimes we don't notice, but uh, really neat fe feature. The famous, uh, uh, station at Toluca. There's no finial on the top of that uh, witch's, witch's hat. It was missing for several years. I think it shows up later on these pictures. We found it when we were cleaning for an open house behind <laughs> one of the patches. It followed out. It was behind the passenger bench there when we were cleaning up. So it's back up there now. It's not quite as straight as it was originally. Okay. I want you to look at this really close. If you look at these shingles here, 
They're all rounded. Gill hand carved every shingle that you see on this structure, all of those. And these shingles were made out of the wrappers for cigars. So he made every piece of the siding here, all the shingles, all of this. And this beautiful witch's hat. It's, it's an incredible structure. Okay. Here again is uh, looking at Toluca. You see another structure that has an opening so that you can see the interior of it. So once again, he has people working on the structure and you can see the neat part of building on the roof, but also the interior. Although I must say, these guys have been working on that building for over 50 years, I'm not sure I'd hire them. Uh, okay, now we have another thing. This is a narrow aisleway here with a wall on this side. And Gil knew that he needed a control panel for the town of Toluca. So if he put a control panel here, it would block people walking by. So he came up with the idea, make the roof of this structure, your control panel. It doesn't take up any aisle space. It's easy to use. It, it's a great little feature. And there's a phone that you use to call the dispatcher. Mr. President, you're gonna to have to tell me when to shut up. All right, here we go with uh, Barnett uh, Fuel and Hardware. Another structure where you set the box cars here, you set the hoppers here, you set the tank cars here. And of course, crews being crews, not everybody did it right, you know. I don't know how they're gonna unload that box car uh, right there, but it is what it is. Okay, there's Jim Long operating the new town of Cayune. Uh, like I say, he always operated the cliff turn. This is narrow gauge right here. Uh, at this time, the layout, they originate around here. They come around the curve come to the stockyard and go around to what's that? That's right. And it doesn't. <laughs> All right. There's uh, looking towards uh, Stony Creek Yard and there's the location where we started our, uh, here we are at the dual gauge town of Stony Creek. You can see all of the, the trackage here and later Gil would add industries here for the yard crew to have to work. That beautiful roundhouse and uh, turntable. There's a, another view. Okay, Don Bozeman switching Apex and Apex Junction. This shows where the branch line comes off. It comes up this incline right here, makes this curve, goes around, goes behind this mountain, comes over this arch and comes up to the town of Craig. And there's uh, the first mine, and it's hard to see in this photograph, but that's Vordenbaum. And the name of the mine is named after his wife. Gil went to Colorado, saw this neat structure, took photographs of it, came home, scratch built it, put it in the town of Craig. Here's uh, S and Z for Mike Spore and Lynn Zimmerman, and it's Monica Mine after um, uh, Mike's wife, Monica. Now, you might say, uh, well, why is that there? Well, it's kind of my favorite building on the layout, as you might guess, but I included it for a real reason. 
Later, Gill was focusing on operations and adding on to the layout. And he said there were so many nice structures that he no longer had to scratch build everything. So he builds this, but look what he added to it. This is not, does not come with the Walther's kit. So he adds this ice platform to really make it a distinct, unique structure. And I, th I think, you know, that's a lesson we should learn. That platform comes along here and goes to Pickard Packing. So, you know, he's using commercial structures, but adding on to them. Uh, here's the town of, can anyone that doesn't know already pronounce that? Anybody know what that town is up there on the above co-op? Talakapaki. When Gill started doing inch and a half scale, he went to Comanche and Indian Gap Railroad and Roy Pickard, that's one of the towns on Roy's inch and a half scale. And he asked and uh, Roy said, certainly. And so he named a town after Talakapaki. And there is the town of Talakapaki. So now the last addition to the layout. Notice this is where we saw earlier. There, this is the end of the layout. There's a narrow gauge. This is Pagosa Junction. So we have an operating session and then we come back a little bit later and this is what it was still looking like. And notice there's no double crossover curve. There's just single. Here we go with a narrow gauge through the mountain. We have our session and then we come back and that appeared. So this is the last town that Gil added. This is the town of Fairview. There was a dedicated operator that operated here. So now the narrow gauge comes off, comes down here. It has the narrow gauge stock cars coming in, making an interchange with the standard gauge. You have Robert operating uh, as a dedicated operator there. You have the oil facility, the narrow gauge brings in oil, it's transferred over to the standard gauge. And you have the rest of the standard gauge town. This building right here, as you can see, was named after Gill. That layout, or uh, that building was on Larry Redmond's Parallax Railroad. And when Larry's railroad was taken down, the family gave that to Gill and Gill uh, liked it and, and remembered Larry and, and put it on the Stony Creek. Little bit of the narrow gauge, starting out at Virginia City. go uh, past a cliff and then we have the mine. And the regular operator was Dave Schaefer and later Spence would do the narrow gauge. Uh, like I said earlier, Gil said had Blackstone had the locomotives when he got started, there probably would have been a lot more narrow gauge. Most operating sessions, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of operation of the narrow gauge, but it's got some incredible scenery and structures on it, as you can see right there. Okay, and it's the quote here from Gil, if I were to start over, I would raise my bench work about six inches. This would be low by today's standards, but I feel a low layout can be viewed better, especially by children. And I'm guessing half of us in here that saw that layout when we were young, we're amazed that we saw this incredible layout. Sorry. It's incredible layout and we got to play with it as kids. Also, I want to point out this car right here. This is a famous articulated car 
the cause of the problem in the tunnel. You see how it, <laughs> how big, it's too big here because it's got just one truck underneath. That was the troublemaker. Okay. Uh, Gil also had diesels that he painted in his own paint scheme. And up there on the trestle, you can see um, the rest of his paint schemes. Okay, now some of the publications. Uh, we see uh, Railroad Craftsman, Model Railroader, of course, uh, the NMRA. He was number 13 on Alan Keller's uh, videos that he did. 1994 was Great Model Railroads. I think that was the second year that it came out. This is uh, the updated version. Gil really thought he was going to be on the cover of this one, and he was not very happy when it was Southern Pacific uh, Z, uh, Tiger Stripes on it. But this is the one that he made the cover. And going back to that earlier story I told you, see, they, they took that out. They took all of this stuff out. They took the price out, all that. and just gave us just the pure photograph with the mass head on it. Really nice. Cow catcher, uh, various issues. And there is a current issue of cow catcher as an update on Gill in Virginia but you might want to go by the hobby store and pick up a copy. It's free. Come on, computer, come on. Uh, courtesy of Craig Brantley, um, he invited and encouraged Trackside Model Railroading to come. They did the last video and last uh, story about the Stony Creek. It is still available. Uh, it costs $5. It's a, it's a good um, publication. Um, it's uh, September of last year. Uh, get a chance, look that one up. Let's see, I think that's... Oh, it, it chopped on me. Sorry about that. Let me get back. All right. Okay. Conscious winning models. Most of them we saw. Uh, you know, like I say, oh, I want to go back to that uh, real quick. Gill became the contest chairman in uh, 1979. And he elected at that time to no longer enter contest. He didn't think it was correct for him to be part of the, the uh, committee and enter contest. He did after he was no longer doing that, enter some more contests. But during that time period, he did not enter any contest. And you can see just how many things he won. Here are some of them. Oh, okay. And um, Patsy Pat Mine, that's named after uh, Patsy Patterson. That was uh, Gil and, uh, and Tom would always compete against models. And uh, that's how they became good friends and are still friends, special, special people. Okay, real quick. I told you about uh, John Lawrence and um, being a, a close friend. He was also at one time the president of the Lone Star region. And um, David Milton in particular said he hated going to LSR meetings because all they had was loads and loads of BS, okay? So Gil builds this um, thing, the structure, chemical plant for um, John Lawrence. And if you read right here, this load is a precision perforator, okay? So it makes perfect holes, right? Now this was 
the flat car load for a while, but uh, as, as uh, Bob and I talked, it caused some problems. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> so provision, uh, perfect uh, holes, right? So that makes, you need a, a special car to hold your outbound perforated manure. Now think about that. Yeah, some of you are getting the joke already. Perforated means holy, and manure is cow. Okay, so I show that because we think of Gil in operation in being very serious, but he wasn't above a joke, and he enjoyed a good joke. And the perforated manure car somehow. David Milton thought that I should have the perforated manure car. I'm not sure what he was trying to say about me, but I do have the holy manure car. Okay, as Emmy said earlier, one of the things that always happened was the spouses were invited when the, I'm sorry? Everybody. So, uh, we have here, we have uh, Patsy Patterson, Tom Patterson's wife. We have uh, Betty Ann Bozeman, Don Bozeman's wife. Of course, we have Virginia. We have Mary Raines, Ed Raines' wife, and my wife, Diane. And, you know, when we would operate, the women would have such good times. Often, not often, all the time, we would hear them laughing. And if we got finished early, they'd still be laughing and we'd all look and say, okay, who's gonna go downstairs and tell them we're finished? Not me, I'm not, no, I'm not breaking them up. Okay, I'm gonna let Bob talk about this because this is Gil after the stroke in operating. Yeah, but, uh, I never could get him to do it during an off session. But we would run off the last of the locals who were left after. Or, uh, we'd run a full operating session, cut it into two or three sessions. This is actually not us operating because Gil would be the engineer. He would have the controller, and I might be way over in the corner saying, all right, reverse it, come back four car lengths, three car lengths, two car lengths, that'll loop. We would switch entire trains that way. So he was still capable of operating. I tried to get him to operate, uh, be the switcher at Stony Creek Yard, let somebody else be the yard master, but I guess he felt like he would be in the way in the aisle. He wouldn't do it. But for a number of years, we actually ran off whatever trains were left over after the operating session. So uh, him being the engineer and me being the brakeman, so to speak. All right, and there, there they are. They were quite a team. So this is, uh, comes to an end. Uh, photos were by Virginia, Doug Jackson, Steve Sandifer, some of them are mine and lots of other fans of the Stoning Creek and West.